Greetings, dear listeners. It is September, which marks our second year anniversary as a show, but also something else. The second largest cause of death for the age group you fall within if you're listening to the show is suicide. Suicidal thoughts, much like mental health conditions, can affect anyone regardless of age, gender, species, or background. Suicidal thoughts, although common, should not be considered normal, and often indicate more serious issues in someone's life. Every year, 800,000 individuals die by suicide, leaving behind their friends and family members to navigate the tragedy of loss. In many cases, the friends and families affected by a suicide loss have feelings of shame and stigma, preventing them from talking openly about it. September is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, a time to share resources and stories in an effort to shed light on this highly taboo and stigmatized topic. Great organizations like NAMI and The Trevor Project use this month to reach out to those affected by suicide, raise awareness, and connect individuals with suicidal ideas to the help they need. There are free calls you can make to professionals who will talk to you. There are tools like affordable online therapy that help you to begin to manage depression and other mental illnesses. We hope that if you are experiencing suicidal thoughts, that you do seek help, and that you do not let a stumble in the road be the end of your journey. On a more cheery topic, we have a quick acknowledgement that two of our tracks this week feature a live orchestra for songs created, written, and recorded specifically for your enjoyment. So to clarify, the campfire theme in Ilmeter's Hope were written and mixed by Stephen Malin, with copyist Peter Jones, orchestrator Christopher Siu, and Budapest Strings recorded by Multiversal, featuring special guest celloist Scott Szymanski. Now it's probably time for us to get started. Do you seek him? You have found yourself among those who rolled the dark dice. What you are about to hear happened long ago, a story brought back from the edge of oblivion, dutifully transcribed, and enhanced orally to better captivate your attention. Previously, the team set off from Ilmeter's Hope to find the town's missing children. Instead, something else found them. Now, while within the roaming forest, can they endure the trials to come? Will the team's resolve hold up? Will odds roll in their favor? Fear the strangers in your midst. Never play games of fate. Dark God. Dark Dice, Chapter 14, Fire Sign. After finishing their short rest, the team followed the path under the darkness of the canopy for nine additional hours. The tall and languid forest, which started in a mix of earthen browns and yellows, shifted, blackening, seemingly charred as if from a recent fire. The grays, blacks, and whites of the leaves seemed more muted, sickly as they continued, the breath of the forest not spurring them to the same motions that they'd seen earlier in the woods. This forest was motionless by comparison. The trees and leaves did not bob or weave but instead creaked in a dry stillness as their mighty limbs overhead created their own dark sky of shadow and timber. As the team's footfall slackened, the forest was briefly sparse, and the mix of aurora and stars overhead spurred their feet to action. And before long, the great forest was dense once again around them, although the trees did not retain any color, even in the dim light of the dying torch. As the team reached their 18th hour of travel since the last long rest, Exhaustion began to settle in, and weary and hungry, their mood only sank when Soren motioned ahead to a new archway in the distance, directly in their path. Up ahead, it's almost like a wall of forest. The trees have literally grown into a weird sort of barrier, preventing us from going anywhere but through the archway. Gods, I even block climbing over it. Maybe this time-shifting stuff fucks with the trees as well. I seem to be always the first one to ask for this, but is it time to rest yet? It's okay, you're getting a bit older, you feel it in your bones more. It's, it's, it's my knees. Mostly, my knee bones. If we have to pass the arch, then we could probably rest here and go through after we've recovered some. So our hope for less arches or no arches in the forest has been quashed. So now all we have to count on is the hope that the forest trail is quicker. I'm sorry, Ayas. That's all right. Part of risk is losing some of the time. It was a gamble, wasn't it, so? I was... I just... 
Seeing the silent one impersonate Barry made this whole thing ten times worse. There was a moment where I knew he was fake, but I just, I just hoped he wouldn't be. I wanted to will him into being the real thing because, because I, I don't know if Barry's still alive anymore, and, and the fact that we took the wrong path means possibly missing him if he does actually escape. Well, let's not worry about it. Let's let's curl up and get some sleep. Indeed. Could use the rest. Well, uh, there are four of us. Oh God. So we can cut the watches up into twelve hours and all get eight hours of sleep. Yep. I'm likely to take the first watch, just so that I don't have that poor, poor Pulo dream again. Who wants to join me? I'm fucking off to sleep, I'm exhausted. I look pleadingly to Ayas, rubbing my knees. Just a thought, it was from the two of us that bad things sprouted in the last little encounter. Is it wise having both of us on watch together? You're right, you're right. Sorry. Honestly, I think we're fucked either way. Shit's gonna come for us, I don't think it really matters who's on watch now. I trust you both almost as much as I trust them, so... But they did get in... If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. Just make sure the first thing you do is scream or wake us up. Don't bother trying to hit, don't bother trying to solve it, just wake someone up. Alright. But if you feel better, I'll, I'll take first watch or so. No, 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 I'll do it. Alright, good night. <laughs> and with that, Rowena took off her armor without ceremony, pulled it over herself like a blanket, put her head on her backpack, and fell asleep before either of the others could even register what had just happened. But as old Father Westpike took his armor off, set up a proper bedroll, donned his nightcap, what were the two heroes, Soren Arkwright, Monster Hunter Renown, and Ayas Inskeep, assassin turned shopkeeper, doing? I'm going to spend most of my time just kind of maneuvering the lantern around, looking at, at the shadows to make sure they're behaving the way I expect. I'm gonna be not playing dice this time. I don't want anything rolling off and fucking us over. I'm probably going to keep watch. I've got a bag of ball bearings, so I might just use a few stress stress balls. That'll keep me pretty well awake. Okay, that's legit. And with a sanity saving throw roll of a 15, Ayas Inskeep recovered five stress and had no difficulty remaining awake. But Soren, however, required a constitution saving throw to remain vigilant. Uh, 20. Natural 20. The first hour passed without any incident. So, Ayas... I've been thinking. Hmm? Uh, I said I've been thinking about a story. Do you want to hear it? Sure. Uh, can't possibly be worse than silence. <laughs> okay, here goes. Once upon a time, long ago, centuries, millennia, even, before the dark miracle, there was an elf. I stand corrected. He's one of those ancient elves loyal to Lord Bithyr, one of the first elven kings of Tural. This elf started off as many of his age did, training to be a great warrior to enlist in the Mithril army. But due to circumstance, he caught eye of the princess, and they quickly became friends. They would meet regularly in secret, took a fancy to one another. A brief, decades-long romance of passion and youth. But one night, the great king's men discovered them together, and our elven hero of yore was sentenced to an eternal vigil. A death sentence to join the front lines in every known war, until the elves no longer had any enemies to war with. Our hero did this with minimal training and poorly crafted gear, and the controlling nature of elven politics would ensure that he never saw the princess again, because the elves very much loved war. So, our hero kept the realm of the elves, which encompassed most of the continent in those days, safe. First, he warred with giants, forcing their survivors into disorganization. He became something of a hero, then he spilled the blood of Yan Ti, taking part in casting their cold-blooded gods into hiding. He did not do this alone, mind you, but as time passed, fewer and fewer of the elves he knew. The great heroes of the age remained by his side. They either died or retired. Only one elf had endured these centuries of hardships, and the two became more than friends while fighting the many enemies of Lord Bithyr. They eventually had a child of their own, 
who was raised into military service knowing only fields of war, sense of duty, and a parent's love, a sad existence. But our hero, the elf, and his partner one day did something incredible, something so amazingly unexpected that the king of the elves had to even acknowledge them, and they were, both of them, gifted with one of the greatest masterworks of the early age of elven craftsmanship, a set of magical shields. What did they do? It's not important because it made no difference to their death sentence, their eternal vigil, and instead of being allowed to return and live a normal life among their kind, they were tasked with spending the rest of eternity in isolation in a dark, cold crypt hidden behind giant statues erected in their honor. They were told that they would be given a most important mission, worthy of the heroes they had become, that they alone would act as scouts against one of the greatest fiends of the Blood War. The Blood War, that's the, um, that's the, the war between the Nine Hells and the Abyss? Where devils keep the unending horde of demons at bay, yes. They were each given rings of sustenance, water, and a very limited supply of books and activities to keep themselves entertained while all of eternity would pass them by and they would never see the sun again. Tracking the weeks themselves became a hobby, and our hero's hatred of their king, of elf kind, of the world itself, only grew. Yeah, I, I think I've heard this one. It, uh, it... Well, I need to pee anyway. I'll be back in a moment to finish the story. Didn't you just go, like, five minutes ago? A uh, small bladder. Soren walked just beyond sight, and returned without incident a few moments later, sitting down and calmly returning to his watch. So, uh, how's the story end? Uh, what story? Aya stared hard at Soren, looking at the torn cloth and scars marking his right side, the stab wound just above his heart, noting Soren's genuine confusion. I think I'm gonna stop playing with these ball bearings and uh, focus up a bit more. Don't want any distractions. Don't want the silent one infiltrating us. Okay. And no more pee breaks either. Buddy system will hold it in. The uncanny duo were able to maintain their vigil during the duration of their watch, but mere feet away, those who were sleeping had less than a pleasant experience. Father Westpike found himself in a dream even more real than the one that came before. He was now face to face with his son Reinar, who grew up rapidly within the corrupting influence of the council members he so despised. Although, in a location he was entirely unfamiliar with. As the events of months flew by in a blink, he followed Reynar through rooms with so many faces, unfamiliar, hated, and even briefly that of young Rowena, among others. As time passed, Reynar was twisted by those around him, and though dressed as a follower of Tempest, with a brooch and flaming sword, he engaged in despicable acts unbecoming of any dwarf, much less a supposed paladin. Sindri watched his son take, hurt, and pillage in the name of a god he knew would be against such brazen acts. There was a darkness in Reynar's heart, fueled by a hatred which Sindri could feel burned for him. Sindri Westpike watched as his son grew up, never knowing the love of his father, only knowing the ways of those who his parents had spent a whole lifetime fighting. This darkness was a sickness, an uneasy sensation of weight and bile that was left within Sindri as he awoke. Rowan was similarly tortured by more visions of Renax with his wife and children. It was a different evening, and Renax was reading them a bedtime story, giving each character in the story a unique and expressive voice. He kissed them goodnight. He kissed his wife goodnight, departing for a late-night meeting at his office. A special work meeting, he told them, that would help their clan. Renax met a different woman that Rowena recognized to be his assistant in a private underground garden and there they began to discuss business while walking together. Seemingly out of nowhere, they kissed passionately, as if a hidden fire within both of them had sparked to a full flame once they knew they were truly alone. Rowena's sadness quickly turned to resentment and further feelings of betrayal. Those feelings of doubt preyed upon her like a carrion. Our friends who were awake were unmarred in their watch. At the end of their shift, Soren quietly noted to Aias that this was the first time nothing bad had happened to them on watch for a very long time. Yay! 
After a long day of travel and a long watch, they woke their counterparts and quickly moved to rest and relax. But what were Rowena and Father Westpike doing, presumably after 15 minutes of uneventful silence? Father Westpike is sitting in front of a fire we've set up. He's wearing his full chainmail and he's polishing the hammer he has. It has get, gotten no use over the last couple of hours. He seems to be doing it more for a meditative sense than out of any duty or use. He seems very deep in thought. Rowena would be looking like really, really pale, very kind of <laughs> green gilled, I think probably a really good expression for it. But she'll, she'll look over at Father Westpike and, um, are you okay? So, sorry, what, what did you say? I asked if you're okay. You look a bit, well, we're supposed to be on watch in your, in your meditation, so are you okay? I'm sorry, I, I know I shouldn't let my mind wander like this. Just had a bad dream, that's all. But dreams are only that. Dreams. I know, but sometimes dreams are just a reflection of things you're worried about. And it's obviously got you worried enough that you're not paying that much attention. So, do you want to talk about it? Maybe you feel better if you spoke about it. Talking can ease the soul, but I think... I think this is... Mm, I think... I don't know what I think. Just spit it out. It's just you and me. Just spit it out. I fear I am a horrible father. I fear I am a horrible husband. And I fear that I have left those that I love to a far worse fate than I thought. My dreams, they... They showed me my son. That he's fallen from the light, fallen very far, and I have no doubts in Pia's accomplishment and her skill, but I fear that I, I may have been too rash to run away like I did. Run away is not the right term, but it's what it feels like now, in retrospect. I, I can't attest to how you're a father to your own kids, but you're still a good person, and I'm going to say something you're probably not going to like. No, you shouldn't have run away. You've left them for far too long. How, how, how long has it been? We're very close to a century now. But it's not like I don't keep tabs on them. I have friends that send me information about them. Is it friends? Or is it Valen Ironshard? It's Valen, yes. He trades regularly within the Frost Iron Mountains and brings me updates about them. About the whole. But it has been a while since I've seen him. My sense of time is feeling particularly muddled here. But... I could swear that it's been less than a decade, but I fear maybe, maybe things have gotten worse. Hopefully not. Well, when you get out of here, you can go find them. Just, it doesn't matter about anything else. I mean, good families, speaking from experience, it's not easy to find. It's not that simple. It's not like I... No, it is. It is that simple. I mean, look at you. And she's going to put her hand on, on his arms. Like, you're a good person, but you're just scared. And there are other options to get your family back. There's other ways to check on them. And you're not alone anymore. I mean, you've... You've saved one of your family. Now let's go save the others. He smiles when you say that. Sometimes time is what helps us all. Rushing to action is not always the best thing to do. Especially in a slow-moving world like ours. I believe what Pia was doing was the right thing. And I believe that if I would have... Thrown down my hammer in that moment... I think I would have ruined things worse. I'm a man of... I'm a man of... pain. And hurt. I deliver it, I receive it. I'm not a man of words. I don't fix things with... with dialogue and talks. I... and that's what's needed now in Westman Salt. It's rational people speaking dialogue, revealing the corruptions and the... the awful things that are going on. A single dwarf wielding a hammer isn't gonna fix the... the deep-seated issues back home. It's going to be fixed by smart people, like my wife. Well, it's lucky for you that you know me, because I can do talking. <laughs> That's all I do. You are a very smart girl. <laughs> I really won't go that far. You very much are. You've surprised me with some of your, uh, with a lot of your knowledge. You seem to be well-read. History, magic. You seem to know a lot for your age. It's the advantage of not giving a crap about <laughs> what my family wanted me to do. Just reading and writing and singing and learning, but... You seem to be very much into that, reading and writing and learning. Well, it's either that or go and put some signatures on the bottom of an acquisition form. <laughs> That's not me. I'm not, what do you call it, a company girl. What the family wants from me is not what I want. The trader's life is not bad if you don't assign yourself to a desk. Travelling the world, seeing different faraway places, speaking to amazing people... 
It can be very fun. Though, of course, difficult. Everybody will try to lie to you to get your stuff from you for cheaper, but I don't think they would do that easily from you. No, we were raised by the best in that. If it's one thing the Kortalum have, it's that they are hard negotiators. And I see you picked it up from them. You take crap from nobody. I try not to, but sometimes you wonder. Like you, I'm not taking your crap about being scared either. We're going to go get them. We're going to fix this. And whatever is going on where your wife and your kids are, we'll fix that. Well, you'll fix that. No, no, we'll fix it. If you if you want to. But I have a church to build when I get back to Ilmater. And without Lady Cavernfall, it's going to be hard. I think I'll probably owe a hand in that. I'm sorry, I, should, I shouldn't bring it up. That was... That was dumb of me. You can see her eyes are definitely beginning to tear up. Rowan, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have spoke of that. Uh, he, like, puts his hands on her shoulder. is like, pushing her against his chest, trying to hug her. I'm sorry. I, sh- I shouldn't have. She kind of pulls away a bit and looks at him. I... I lied earlier when I said that all that happened was I, I was in a room, climbed out a tree. That, that... What happened? Well, I, uh... uh I woke up in this room and there was this cauldron and it had a a note over the top of it and it said that I couldn't cheat and I had to drink it all and that the key to get out of the room was in the bottom and I tried the door because why wouldn't I and uh, well it was locked at least I thought it was and I didn't know where you were This was just your dream, like the dream I had She shakes her head No, it's not a dream You know how you went and came through a portal. You thought you're definitely awake. I was definitely awake. This wasn't a dream. Anyway, um, I couldn't open the door. It was locked. And I uh, I didn't know where you were. I didn't know where anyone else was. And I, I figured this Roman forest being what it is, is just do what it said. And uh, I drank the stew. I drank it all. I drank it down to the very bottom. And I tried not to taste it. I tried not to think about it, but... When I got to the bottom, and there were two eyes in there, and... Eyes? Yeah, she nods. And there was, um... There was Lady Cameron's false head in there. No, this this is... I didn't mean to kill her. I didn't. You you didn't. (laughs) It wasn't you. It was a sword. It's just the forest's tricks. It's not real, Rowena. Don't believe the forest. It doesn't matter if what I drank was her or not. It doesn't matter. I still killed her. No, you didn't. You you silly girl. You didn't. That sword was cursed. Created by some mad magic. It wasn't you. It wasn't your hand. It was the blade. We're not responsible. You know, I thought I killed you. And when I saw it going to her instead, I was really relieved. I know it sounds horrible, but it's true. I'm really so, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. He doesn't let you struggle anymore, and he, like, forces you into a hug. Rowena, oh, it's not your fault. None of this is your fault. This place makes a madman out of all of us. It's not real. That was a dream. A trick. The Force is trying to break you, and you're stronger than this. I just want to go home. As soon as we find the children, we will all go home. All of us. And I will vouch for your sanity and for your your innocence. I will not let anybody harm you or claim that you have done anything wrong. You came here out of the goodness of your heart. And this godforsaken place has turned you, turned your mind against you, turned your body against you. You are not responsible, Rowena. And he squeezes you into a hug. She hugged him back, like, really tightly. <laughs> She's basically just trying to contain her sobbing. It's okay. Don't think. Don't. I know it's beyond me to tell you not to think. Your mind is a great place. But just know that you are not responsible for this. Just know. You. You're a good person. You could have stayed back in Ilmeter's Hope. You could have helped the women plow the fields if you wanted. But no, you decided to risk your life to come here running with me. You didn't come here out of malice, out of hate, or out of jealousy, out of greed, or any of the things that motivate most of the people I know. You came here simply out of the goodness of your heart. You came here to help. Uh, She pulls back a bit and wipes her tears on the back of her hand and she says, Yep, and that's that's clearly working out great for both of us. (laughs) 
he wipes away a, a single tear that was like welling up in his eye as he's trying to stay stoic, listening to Ruana cr- uh, sob. It's fine. It's fine. Lady Cavernfall knew the dangers we were gonna face, and she chose to sacrifice herself. You did not choose to wield that blade in that way. As you talk about choosing to sacrifice herself, it looks as if she's coming to a decision. And she nods. And, okay. Okay, so we've got a plan. We get home and we fix all the shit we get home as a plan. First we fix Ilmeter's hope, then we fix ourselves. Let's do the sh- easy things first. Yeah, sounds like a plan. And uh, she'll pull out her harp and she'll start to play some of the kind of music that she's heard in the church that she was uh, around you guys with when they, she first arrived. He picks up quickly what she's playing and starts uh, hymning along with the tunes. That was awesome. <laughs> I love you guys. Um, <clears throat> him. Uh, back to a regularly scheduled program. Rowena and Father Westpike both recovered 10 stress damage. However, mere feet away, in Soren's dreams, or... Wait, no. This felt more like memories or deja vu, where he could plainly see his hands on flesh, on his knife, torturing people. So many people. Men, women, the elderly, children, elves, humans, dwarves, dragonborn, a screaming frost giant, and a a unicorn? So many victims. The blade in Soren's hands was always the same. His favorite one, his cursed dagger with its singular edge. The patterns it cut that the flesh of the innocent were so familiar, so beautiful, intoxicating, genuinely enchanting. A mixture of infernal and delightful imagery. And above it all, a phrase repeated over and over in his voice. Do you seek him, Dahafwikma? Do you seek him, Dahafwikma? And as Soren beamed proudly at his worksmanship, with flecks of flesh and muscle in his beard, breathing heavily as he surveyed the beauty of his magnum opus, he thought very seriously that after so many years of seeking him, he might finally have found a way to reach the nameless god within his very dreams. And just like that, Soren awoke to a distant clicking sound. Absolutely, and I wake up very perturbed. Ah yes, mere feet away in the physical world, relived the day-to-day of his pleasant activities at Ilmer's Hope, running the inn, fetching water, afternoon tea with Mayor Delvin Brighthope. However, his son was absent in all of these memories. Weeks flashed by in an instant. Ayas enjoyed the special winter festival of his son's birthday alone. Baron's first day of school, his previous birthdays, afternoons of work, now as if he'd never existed at all, never had a son. And the more Ayas saw, the more it felt like his previous memories were imperfect, perhaps even incorrect. Did he ever have a son? Instead, he remembered simply walking by the school building on his way to the well, staring coldly at Gilly, celebrating his own birthday quietly, alone during the winter festival, meeting the children of the village at their parents' request as a boogeyman of sorts to warn them of the dangers of the wider world. Ayas began to actively question if Baron was real at all. In his dreams, he saw his own acid scar face in the mirror smugly approach. If he's real, then why don't I have a memento of him on my person? Ayas could hear the words, see himself saying them, but he was not sure if it was really him. However, the fear that it could be made his blood run cold as he found himself suddenly awake, shivering, feeling around desperately with his injured arm to find proof of his son's existence. If he's real, then why don't I have a memento of him on my person? 
yet Ayas could not find it. In his panicked state, failing his sanity saving throw, he did not notice three missing candles, one missing dice set, one missing day of rations, and seventeen gold that had vanished simply into thin air. Fuck, 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 something, anything! The others simply watched as Ayas frantically searched his pack and pockets. Soren noted that the air was heavy with the scents of mildew and fresh dirt, and just beyond the edge of the campfire, he swear that he heard a clicking sound. But it stopped just as suddenly as it started. I'm gonna rush over to Ayas and basically just help him to his feet but stand in front of him. Just holding on to, like, basically having pulled him to his feet but still holding on to his arm. Father Westpike gets up, holding his hammer and his shield, and he puts himself between the party and whatever the sound was. Ayas, you okay? What's happened? Now on his feet, Ayas's hands continued to search his pockets compulsively, checking and rechecking the hidden linings on his clothing, uncaring if the others could see him. I am. Uh... My son, I, I just had a horrible dream about my son. He, he, he wasn't there, and I, I don't have anything of him at all anywhere. I, you know he's real, right? You, you, you know him, right? You saw him. I, I didn't just make him up. I'm not crazy, right? All right, seeing that West Pike is in front of us, I'm just going to kind of turn a bit and grab both of his hands, like grab both of his arms, and I'm just going to look him straight in the eyes, or look up, I guess. I'm going to look him in the eyes. I'm going to say, you have memories of him, right? Who he is? I... I... <laughs> Yeah, yes and, and no, I but the uh, the the dreams the, the No 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 ignore we've just had a pretty lengthy discussion about dreams. Trust me, what you feel here and she'll put her hand over up to his heart, that's what important. Everything here is just fucking with us, alright? Alright. So so long as you know here that he's still your son and that you love him, that's what counts. Everything else here is just a fuck with us, so just don't pay attention to that. We've got you. Right? Thank you, Rowena. You're okay for a murderess. It's okay. Just stay with us. Can't lose anyone to anything. We can't afford the freak out. You're gonna be okay. You're right. You're right. I'm sorry. No, don't don't worry. It's better we express these things than keep them bottled, because they'll just niggle at us. Right? Don't ever be sorry for saying things that are concerning you. <laughs> just remember what's real. Rowena? Can I say something to you in private? Uh, yeah, sure. What? I seriously do not remember ever meeting a son. I never have, and I am essentially the village priest. There is a very real danger that both of our travelling companions may have started the journey in... in less than full mental strength. I really don't want to believe that. But it may be true. And we have to be ready for that possibility that either or both of them may turn on us when we find the the children. Because Ayas hates religion. Is it possible that maybe he just, you know, never let his kid hang out with us because you talk to yourself into religion and I'm well me, so he kind of thinks we're bonkers? It is possible, but I am just saying, prepare yourself. Six hours into their long rest... Soren caught a glint of eyes in the distance. Five pale yellow eyes, one of which was bisected. While notching a flaming arrow, Soren is going to say, We are no longer alone. Get to the gate! As Soren let loose the arrow, the light missed its target, but briefly illuminated the heaving, stretched monstrosity of chitin and claws. Its features warped and stretched as it began to charge the team from where it crept in waiting 80 feet away. Next time we'll take the left path, okay? Of course I will. Retreat to the gate, now! We can do that! We can do that! The team was able to reach the archway before the creature was on top of them, and once they passed through, they immediately felt that strange sense of familiarity, like they had been here before, like they almost belonged here. They watched as a pack filled with three days' trail rations was crushed underfoot by the creature, which... Oh, by the way, before the long rest, you all consumed an additional day of trail rations, unless otherwise noted. Yep. I will not. I refuse to eat my dinner. That's understandable under the circumstances. Also, each of them lost two points of an attribute of their choice. Back to the adventure. As the team looked back, they could see the creature moving at an unnaturally fast pace, a blur of motion that left a trail of its outline as it moved. The creature paced with relaxed motion but deadly speed a dozen times in the blink of an eye before returning back to the darkness from whence it came. The thing's not following us through the archway. I wonder why. Probably knows about the weird time dilation thing. Perhaps something about the time is... uh... un... un... It's dangerous to it. You two should go back to sleep. Yeah, we need like another four hours to get a full rest at this point, assuming no funny business. Yeah. We should, you two should go back to sleep. We'll finish out our watch, don't you worry. You're the one who mostly spent on that fight against those freaks. You threw everything you had at them. 
You should definitely be the one who goes back to sleep. None of us got a real rest. Yeah, but we have a watch to do. If I'm not doing much, I'll be fine. We've got our music. Behind them, the creature returned to circle around the gate, pacing another twenty or so times as its blurred outline trailed behind. It looked up, stared directly at Soren, and vanished again into the darkness. None had time to react as the entirety of the description took place in less than the blink of an eye. I suddenly feel very vulnerable standing this close to the portal. Let's take the conversation a few feet further away. Okay, maybe we should move on a little bit before we rest as well. Yeah, let's keep moving. Yeah, we keep moving. The team walked 80 feet, 90 feet, 150 feet. Ayas, eyes fixed on the archway, nearly tripped as he saw the creature creep slowly through and sprint off into the woods. Guys, that thing came through. Through the archway? Yep. Okay, what have we got? We... We really have to rest. I mean... I suppose I could set up my little rope, string and bell thing to let us know it's coming. Do you have... I know you said you got a bag of bull bearings. Have you got a bag of caltrops or anything? Of what? I take that as a no. No, I don't, probably. That's... Oh, fuck. My rope appears to only have ten feet left. I think it cut and frayed in a few spots when I was bit earlier. So, we hunt it. The next person who sees it, take a shot. We need this creature dead. It's not going to let us rest. All right. Where did you see it go? Uh, It went east. Or whatever way that is. Right side of the path. Gotcha. Can you do that warding thing that you put on me earlier? Uh, yesterday? Uh, it has a limited time span. It will only... Le- it will last less than an hour. Alright, so let's make one of us a target. Oh, interesting. And it will last exactly an hour, sorry. Let's make one of us a target. I can protect myself good enough. What's your plan? Lie down the road and look like roadkill? I was thinking just standing here looking like I want to try and beat it in the face and look really, like, pathetic and, you know, to be fair, I'm not really wearing much in the way of armor. You don't look like much, but you pack quite the punch. Yes, but they don't know that. Exactly. All right, so we're trying to lure it out. Well, we need to rest, and if we keep walking, we're not going to get any rest. Let's deal with it now. All right. I touch her and give her a warding bond. Give her, like, a gentle touch. (laughs) Rowena felt more prepared to take on the horror lurking within the woods as the protective wards of Palor flowed through her. Sweet. I say we make camp, the three of us sit around the lantern, and she will walk off a little bit, not more than 20 feet make herself a target. Okay. No, you guys need to be ahead of me. That way I can't lose track of the road. I, yeah, I, I imagine... Oh, wait, no. If I'm ahead, then you can run to me. That's even better. Wait. Fuck that. Actually, you know what, guys? I think we're letting far too much time pass with all of our resting. If we can keep going, I think we should. We just need to keep on keeping our eyes out behind us for you know, for this creature. I've got a feeling that, that we should just keep going. We do feel stressed for time now that we're on this side of the archway. I'm inclined to agree. Fine. Then I say we continue, but like I said earlier, shoot at the thing if you ever see it. Lure it out. Force it out of the forest if we see it. Yeah, I like this plan, and I start walking to lead the team. Well, if we do, you two are going to have to take watch tomorrow, because I've lost half my spells. I've got nothing right now. Don't worry. I'll take care of it. Ayas led the team onward over the next two hours, picking the left path every time a split presented itself, as the trees themselves changed from black to a new variety of white. Some of the trees were almost bony and rigid, while others were soft, pale, and fleshy. Long strands of moss that almost resembled hair replacing leaves, and the trees they saw looked sickly, covered in knobs that twitched, pustules filled with bubbling liquid that sloshed as the trees shifted during the strange breaths of the forest, which had become more labored, almost like a wheeze, and also more frequent. As more time passed, all four of the team felt as though they could see faces in the trees, and they were not sure if they were truly alone anymore, even without the presence of monsters. Their only reprieve came a few hours later, when, in the distance, they could see a light up ahead as the trees became more sparse and visibility increased greatly. Nearing the edge of the forest, they could just make out the shape of a ruined structure five miles ahead of them, and about a half mile in the distance, an empty stone archway that the path continued through. At long last, they had reached the domain of the Nameless God. Dark Dice, Chapter 14, Fireside, starring David Alt as Ayas Inskeep, Peter Lewis as Soren Arkwright, Ithor Vithyarsson as Father Sindri Westpike, Cassie Rilinicki as Filgia the Witch, Hem Cleveland as Lady Rowena Granitepike, and Travis Van Groff as Dungeon Master, with transcriptions by Hem Cleveland. This episode was co-edited by Sarah Baczynski and Marissa Ewing of Hemlock Creek Productions. 
Produced with sound design by Travis Van Groff, with mixing and mastering by Hemlock Creek Productions. This episode featured music by Travis Van Groff, Sam Bose Miller, Stephen Malin, and Fui Madin. To support this presentation and get access to bonus releases, music, and an early copy of the adventure, including transcriptions, artwork, and more, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash libertypodcast. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at Dark Dice Pod. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening.